Hello there, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined today by Dr. Aaron Boster, who will answer as many of your questions as he can for the next 60 minutes. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Boster is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and related central nervous system inflammatory disorders. He decided to become a multiple sclerosis doctor at age 12 as he watched his uncle Mark suffer from the disease in an era before MS treatment was available. Dr. Boster grew up in Columbus, Ohio and attended undergraduate school at Oberlin College he earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed an internal medicine and residency in neurology internship at the University of Michigan. He then completed a two-year fellowship in clinical neuroimmunology at Wayne State University. Since then, Dr. Boster has been intimately involved in the care of people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He has been a principal investigator in numerous clinical trials trained numerous multiple sclerosis doctors and nurse practitioners, and published extensively in medical journals. He, he lectures to MS patients and providers worldwide with a mission to educate, energize, and empower people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his son, Maxwell. Dr. Boster, we are so happy once again to have you with us, and I am going to turn it over to you. But let me first tell those people that have not um, been with us before that don't know the system of the Zoom, I'm going to tell them how to um, submit their question. Perfect. So if you have a question or comment, you can ask it with the Q&A button in the app, which also allows you to send your question anonymously if you choose to do it that way. You can even ask your question by um, live if you would like by raising your hand and then I'll just unmute you. To do so, just click the raised hand button or press star nine if you're on your phone. I'll call on you, and at that time, of course, you'll have to unmute. So there you go. It's all yours. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. Um, the MS Foundation is an amazing organization, and the fact that you have maintained this strong commitment to helping up our game, I think, uh, really deserves a chapeau, a hat off. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all day during my busy clinic, and I can't wait to get at these questions. Okay, let's see here. Um, Bavia, do you have me as the co-host? Because I yes. don't see, I don't see any questions on there. Let's see. Neither do I. I don't see any questions submitted. Okay. In the UK, so well, I'm, go ahead with email first. Yes, yeah, it gives me the opportunity to also, read the email. Um, just to, I'm not sure if maybe everybody needs to know a reminder. This is a Q&A. So please feel free to ask any questions related to MS and Dr. Boster will knowingly do his best to answer them. And I'm sure he will actually answer every single one of them. He does. Okay, so let's see. We have one that came in from somebody by the name of Phage. Um, the questions are, what are the blood tests MOG and Aquiporin? And why should I fight to have them taken? So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition affecting the brain and spinal cord. And there are several cousins of multiple sclerosis, which are different autoimmune conditions that are um, somewhat related uh, to, to MS. And so one of them is called neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD. Another one is myelin oligodendrocyte um, MOG, all right? So you've got MOGOD and you've got NMO. And these are conditions, they're not multiple sclerosis, they're similar to MS. And they involve an autoimmune process where the B cells, the humoral immune system is goofy and attacks parts of you that it shouldn't. And unlike with MS, NMO has an antibody test. MOG has an antibody test. So when we are working someone up to see if they have multiple sclerosis, I think it's uh, a best practice to check the antibodies for MOG and the antibodies for NMO. And we want to make sure that we aren't actually dealing with one of those entities instead of MS because it would change the treatment. Thank you. 
Um, we also have another one that says, is it typical in the setting of MS to have a mysterious ongoing UT issue that doesn't test positive in a urine culture or affect relative blood values and hurts like the devil when sitting? Even after seven days of precautionary antibiotic, what could be going on and what could be done about it? So I think the person is talking about UTIs or um, urinary tract infections. And in the setting of multiple sclerosis, people are at a higher risk of suffering from a urinary tract infection. Here's the kicker. Sometimes nature is a little too generous. And instead of having a UTI, you can have pain in the down there's, which can sort of mimic a UTI. And so this might be the situation where you need to kind of work carefully with the neurologist and the urologist to get to the bottom of it. There's a host of neuropathic pain syndromes, which can affect the down there's and can kind of mimic those symptoms. And I wish you the best of luck. That's Thank pretty you. Um, as long as did this man, man actually wrote in from Jerusalem. So he wanted us to know he had three questions and we might as well give him the third one also. Could we review what I want to follow up on after treatment with Ocrevus besides reasonable WBC counts? So I'm, I'm guessing at the question, but I think the person's asking about what laboratories do we follow? Like what things do we follow when we give someone Ocrevus? So Ocrevus is one of the multitude of medicines that are available to treat multiple sclerosis, one of my faves. It's an infusion that's given in the vein twice a year and it depletes B cells. And so when I give someone with MS Ocrevus, I want to check a CBC, a complete blood count, which is going to give me the total white blood cell count and the lymphocyte count. And so those are two things that I would like to know. I also am fond of knowing the immunoglobulin numbers. Immunoglobulin is a Scrabble word, uh, code for antibodies, because we have to talk in doctor talk sometimes. So, so we want to look at the immunoglobulin levels, the antibody levels, and make sure they're not too low. And sometimes if I'm feeling particularly sassy, I may get lymphocyte subsets, which will give me information about the CD19 uh, count, which kind of tells me about how the B cells are recovering. Now, those are key things that I like to look at when I'm exploring some laboratories for someone who's getting ochreous. Thank you. And the next person who wrote in said that they'd like, they have concerns between MS and shingles virus. And is the shingles vi vaccine recommended for someone with MS? So people impacted by MS are not immunosuppressed, right? So having MS by itself does not suppress your immune system. On the contrary, your immune system is all revved up. However, many of the most effective medicines to treat MS are immunosuppressants. So they work by suppressing the immune response. And if we suppress the immune response, there's a risk of opportunistic infections. One of the most common, varicella, chickenpox. And so we want to check the VZV titer, the varicella titer, before we start one of these immunosuppressive therapies. And if we find that you're not mounting an adequate response, we can vaccinate you. We can give you a Shingrix vaccine and we can vaccinate you against uh, that risk of infection. Thank you. Kathy, Kathy wants to know, do you have to have contrast with your MRI if you've had no flares? So that's a great question and I'm gonna break it in half. Why do we get MRIs and do we need contrast? So there's three ways that I learn about how a human with MS is doing. The number one way, the most important way is by what they tell me, right? So you are a U expert. You know more about you than any test, than any other person on earth, actually. And if I can be a good listener and listen to how you're doing, I'm going to learn the most. That's number one. Number two is to look at structural damage. And we do that with the MRI. And the MRI can tell us if there's new brain damage or new spinal cord damage since the last time we checked. And by the way, the third way is functional testing, like when we have you do like the MS Olympics, like all that kind of stuff. So I like to get an MRI about once a year when you're not having disease activity. So if you have an MS attack, I don't need an MRI. I have you. You're showing me that you're not doing well. It's when things are copacetic and good in the hood 
and we're thinking that everything is dandy like candy, that I want to get an MRI to make sure that I'm not missing something under the hood, so to speak, or something that's subclinical, which would tell me, wait a second, you think you're okay, but you're not. All right. And so I think that it's best practice to get an MRI of the brain about once a year when you're doing well to make sure that we're not seeing any surprises. Now, the second piece to that is, do we need to give contrast? And the short answer is no, but it helps. So when you give contrast, I learn more information than when we don't give contrast. And all things being equal, I would prefer to give you contrast. However, if you don't want contrast for whatever reason, or if there's a contraindication against it, we just don't give it. Now, the MRI is still very useful. It's not as useful, but it's darn close. Thank you. Another person wrote in and said, I've heard you speak before about tests, surveys you have MSers do each time they come in. What are they? Because this person wants to know, what do you think about MS clinics that do not do tests or surveys like that? So I, I shared in the last question that there are three ways that we assess how you're doing. And I shared that the number one way is by what you tell me. And there's a couple different ways that we can learn about what you tell me. One way is I can say, how are you doing? And then I can shut up and listen, right? And then you'll tell me how you're doing. Another way is I can use a tool called patient reported outcome measures, which is very fancy words for a survey or like a questionnaire. And I find giving a survey before the visit to be extremely valuable. Now, I have three surveys that I send to my patients before I see them. One of them is a depression screening tool, right? People impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience depression compared to the general population. And so I have a very keen interest in making sure that we identify that so we can treat it. The second tool that I send out is a survey looking at fatigue because fatigue is the most common symptom in MS and it's invisible and it can destroy the quality of your life. And honey, you look so good and yet you're exhausted inside. And so by checking a fatigue scale, I find that to be very helpful. Then I have a really, really large battery that I send people that takes about 10 minutes to fill out. And it's chocked full of a bunch of other surveys that are asking about aspects of your life, aspects of function, all kinds of different things about your MS. And when you fill that out, before I see you, I review it all. And I find it to be extremely informative. Now, what do I think about an MS center that doesn't do that? Well, I don't think that they're bad or naughty. Um, I think that they are not getting that piece of information. Now, maybe they're collecting that information in another manner. I know that for me and for my patients, taking a few minutes up front to collect that information really helps us make the visits very, very effective. And at least in my clinic, I find it to be very useful. Good, thank you. Um, how do you test for, for asbesticity in the calves? Someone's asking, Robert. Oh, so one way to test for spasticity in the calves is to ask the person if they have spasms or charley horses in their calves, right? And they'll tell you. So yeah, my calf cramps up and I drop to the ground. It hurts like the dickens. Okay, well, that's one way to assess. Another way is to do a, a deep tendon reflex. So when the neurologist takes the hammer and he smacks the back of your heel and he sees if your foot moves, that's a test for tone and that tests spasticity. Another way is to take that reflex hammer and to scratch the bottom of your foot and see if your toe pops up. Another way to do it is to grab the ankle and the foot and move the foot back and forth and see how much resistance is there. And my favorite way, if the patient is ambulatory, is to watch them walk and I can see if spasticity is affecting their gait. Makes sense. Um, Angelette would like to know any suggestions on how to break up scar tissue where I've been doing DMT injections for 20 years. And that's a great question that nobody really ever asks. So, so, so. I feel bad, Angela, that you've been injecting for 20 years. The reason I say that is when those drugs came out, they were cutting edge and they're not anymore. And there are actually medicines that in comparison are more effective and they're not injections. I also want to commend you that you've been injecting for 20 years because it takes quite a robust human being to subject yourselves to you know, the Macarena. 
Now, if you inject yourself for a long period of time, whether that be MS drugs or, or drugs for diabetes or what have you, you can cause some changes to the skin and you can cause some scarring. So what can you do about that? One is you can use a vitamin E, like so you can use a topical vitamin E. Um, another thing you can do is you can rub the scar and try to break down the scar tissue. But the biggest thing that I would do is I would switch drugs to something where you don't have to jab yourself with a needle. Thank you. Um, Linda's asking, is foot drop ever caused by circulation issues? No, but circulation issues can be caused by foot drop. So foot drop, so let's pretend this is my foot because I can't lift my leg up this high. Okay, so this is my leg and this is my foot. And when you walk, you have to pull your foot up. And so if it flops down, that's called a foot drop. And that's really not cool because it can grab the ground and it can cause you to tumble. And if you have a leg with a foot drop, you don't move the ankle as much. And by not pumping the ankle, you're not pushing the venous blood back up. And so you can get a circulation problem in the leg that doesn't move very much where, where all the blood is pooling. I'm not familiar with a circulation problem causing foot drop, however. Typically, in the setting of MS, at least, a foot drop is caused by a neurological issue. Thank you. Um, please discuss the up and coming BTKI classification of drugs. Where is the MS progression? Are they best used? Where in the MS progression are they best used? So, so that's a great question. Let's unpack it a little bit. So right now, there are 27 different formulations of 19 different MS medicines FDA approved to treat MS. And we are excited about a couple of agents that are being developed, which we think are going to be the next best thing. So at the Boster Center for MS, we're currently doing a multitude of clinical trials, and most of them are studying BTK inhibitors. Now, BTK does not stand for bind, torture, kill as that like crazy like serial killer. Um, it stands for brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitor, okay? And when you take uh, the BTK inhibitor, that's a pill, mm -hmm. it does two remarkable things. One thing that it does is it can interfere with B cell communication in the absence of murder. So it doesn't kill the B cell. It just plugs the B cell's ears so that it can't hear anything, right? And that is really remarkable. And that can interfere with humoral autoimmunity. And that can really help MS, we believe. The other thing that BTK inhibitors can do, which are remarkable, is they cross the blood-brain barrier into the brain where there are these cells called microglia. Now, microglia are part of the immune system, but they're not the uh, adaptive immune system, the B and T cells that we talk about all the time. It's the innate immune system, the other part of the immune system that we've never been able to touch yet. And these microglia, which are resonant in the brain, when they are inappropriately activated, they become like the Incredible Hulk, and they eat things they're not supposed to, like your brain. And so these BTK inhibitors turn them off. Now, the question is, where do we place BTK inhibitors? And the answer is, we don't know yet. So at present, we're doing multiple clinical trials. So at the Boster Center, we're doing trials for relapsing remitting MS secondary progressive MS, and primary progressive MS. Wow. And based on the results of the trials, we are going to figure out where that drug is best placed. I will share with you, because of its effect on microglia, we're very hopeful that it will work to treat progression of disability. Wow, how exciting that is. Thank you for sharing that. So new COVID shot, so many opinions on Oak Purvis. What did they do? Get it. Get it? 100%. Get the COVID shot. Yep. Okay. Mr. Anonymous or Miss Anonymous, you heard it. Okay. How about, uh, Kathy, would like to know, do you have to have contrast with your MRI when you have been stable with no flares? We already talked about that. Yep. We got that question. Yep. That was on two different sites. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm on a B cell depleting DMT, rituximab. What does the neutrophils and lymphocytes count mean in my blood work done before my next infusion? So 
when we give rituximab, which is a B cell depleter, like ocrelizumab or ufutumumab or ublituximab, those are all B cell depleters, all right? And they're all in the same family, like Pepsi, Coke, RC Cola, Mr. Pib, like, right? So, so they're all related. They all work by depleting B cells. And one of the things that we want to look at is how are the white blood cells doing? So it's not uncommon that the neurologist may order a CBC, a complete blood count, which gives us the total white blood cell number. But that white blood cell number is made up of five subtypes of white blood cells, right? Nobody likes my Easter basket. That's the mnemonic that I taught myself when I was a third year med student and I had hair and no beard. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils are the five kinds of blood cells. And the ones of interest are predominantly the lymphocytes, and then also to a lesser extent, the neutrophils. And so when you are taking rituximab or one of those other B cell depleters, it's reasonable to check the lymphocyte count and the neutrophil count to make sure that it's not too low because if it's too low, that may increase the risk of infection. And so what I presume is that your neurologist is doing some investigations to be able to tell you whether or not it's safe to proceed and whether or not you have a significant increased risk of infection. Thank you. And the next one might be a little difficult for you to answer. <laughs> might be a little personal, the but okay. accept the challenge. I knew you would. So Julie said, I am in my late 40s and have recently been diagnosed with recurrent transverse myelitis. My older lesion and one active, one older lesion and one active lesion, both in my cervical spine with symptoms like leg weakness, but nothing in my brain. Is this MS or could be something else? Is it best to go with most efficacious drug? My doctor is prescribing either Rituxin or Abagio. Thank you. And I love listening to you. Oh, you're very kind. Um, that is an action-packed question, and I'm going to retrofit it. First of all, I want you to take Rituxan over Abagio, 100 million percent, okay? So Abagio is a very lovely medicine. I use it a lot in practice, um, but it's not a high-powered medicine. And when people have spinal cord involvement, I'm not comfortable using it. I would much much prefer that you take rituximab. Now, again, this is just my opinion and I don't have enough information to say with authority what you should be doing, but just off the cuff with the small amount of information I have, I feel strong, emotionally, I feel very strongly that we want to use rituximab. Now, the first part of the question is a really interesting one. You've had transverse myelitis, so inflammation of your spinal cord, not once, but at least twice. You have recurrent transverse myelitis. And recurrent transverse myelitis might be caused by MS. It could also be caused by NMO, that thing that we talked about at the beginning, the very first question, or MOG. Here's the kicker. Rituximab treats all three of them. And so when in doubt, I'm very keen on using something that's going to cover all my bases. Abagio would not. Rituxan absolutely would. Wow. Great answer. Great answer. Okay. Um, the, the gentleman from um, Jerusalem wrote back saying, testing, LOL. I asked one neurologist why she didn't do any testing at all. And she answered, I saw you walk in. That's enough. <laughs> EDSS7. So. So, you know, I, I have almost made a career not trying to understand what other doctors think. Um, that stated, um, I was trained by a great man. I was trained by an MS expert, uh, who's no longer with us. Um, that's Dr. Omar Azar Khan and Dr. Khan, who taught me MS neurology used to say, Aaron, if I can watch them walk in and I can shake their hand, that's the most important piece of the exam I'm going to get. Now for the record, Dr. Khan did full neurological examination. So he was doing all the MS Olympics. But watching someone walk is arguably amongst the most useful things that we have available. Great. Um, when would you recommend a patient moving from Zaposia to Ocrevus? As fast as possible. Why? Because Zaposia is not awesome at slowing disability progression 
whereas Ocrevus is very awesome at slowing disability progression. So it's an upgrade in the therapy. A subgroup of individuals on B cell depleters experience crap gap. What are some ways this is addressed? So the medicines, the B cell depleters that are given every six months, ocrelizumab and rituximab are the ones we think about most of the time, are given every six months. And there are some patients, not most, but there are some patients where the last month or so, they feel kind of punky. They don't feel very good. And it's not a matter of like, like just being tired. They literally can have like old MS symptoms come back out. And some uh, patients have kind of coined this uh, phenomenon, the crap gap, which I think is rather descriptive. I kind of like it. And so I have hundreds and hundreds of patients that receive B-cell depleters, and some of them experience crap gap. I think it's very real, and it's very unpleasant. And so let's talk about some things that could be done. Well, first of all, in an imaginary world where I'm king for a day, I'm going to give uh, these medicines every four months instead of every six. And that's not going to happen because it's very, very expensive, and insurance companies in, in America won't allow that, much to my chagrin. Um, but that's one thing that I would like to be able to do. I simply can't. Something that I can do is a month and a half or so before the next infusion, I can give a slug of steroids. And I do this very frequently with people who have crap gap. I give them a gram of IV solumedrol in the vein, or I give them the equivalent of high dose oral steroids. And that helps them kind of coast into their infusion. In another hypothetical world, I could give them a sample of Kisemta. So Kisemta is a B cell depleter and it's a shot that you give yourself once a month. And there are samples laying around uh, most MS clinics and golly gee Wilkers. You could grab one and you could hypothetically give them a shot, hypothetical. Uh, another thing you could do if it's bad enough is you could actually switch them to a different medicine. Thank you. Um, anything we can do to help the circulation issue besides compression socks and keeping the legs elevated? Massage can be very, very helpful. Heat can be very helpful. And um, if you put an under the desk peddler, you know, like those little pedal devices, that's another way to do it. Those can all be very, very helpful. Right. Teresa said, um, I have PPMS and wonder if there is any treatment medication for balance issues, which is one of my most debilitating symptoms. There is no pill for balance. It does not exist, but, but physical therapy, specifically neurophysical therapy is an outstanding tool to buttress balance. And so get ye to the physical therapist, I say, and tell them, look, my balance is not good. I'm at risk of falling. And they will give you enumerate exercises to optimize your balance. You can retrain balance um, and it takes a careful hand. And so you can accomplish that through physical therapy. And then um, someone's asking, the, well, they said they have an active disease on the MRI between year one and two of Mavenclad. Does this mean the DMT is a possible fail? I don't think so. So if I gave you five days of an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection, and I called you on day two and said, hey, how's your bladder? You would say, oh my gosh, Aaron, it's terrible. It burns when I urinate. I have a foul smell. I have a sense of fullness. Why? Because we're not done being treated yet. And so the way that we give the micro induction of Mavenclad is we give two months up front. We wait a year and give two months. And it literally takes two cycles to do all the magic. And so if you had disease activity between the first year and the second year, I'm simply going to fill in the gaps with steroids and I'm going to keep on keeping on. But I would not yet consider that a failure. Thank you. Um, would you recommend Briumvi over Ocrevus for PPMS? No. So, so um, PPMS is a nasty animal. And in the United States, we have one drug which has been proven through uh, adequate clinical trials to show that it's efficacious in PPMS, and that's Ocrevus. Briumvi has never been studied in PPMS in a way that's adequate to prove that it works or not. 
Is it possible that Briumvi could treat PPMS? Yes, it's possible, but I would not pick it over Ocrevus just because the data supports Ocrevus use in PPMS. Heidi would like to know, when can you stop taking meds if you have been stable and have no new lesions in years? So I have a very strong opinion about this. I refuse to treat people after they die. So I don't care what your family says. I don't care if it's in your will. I will not treat your MS after you pass away, period. Medicines have not been tested after death. I don't know how to infuse you or give you a pill because you won't swallow it and your heart's not pumping blood around. And it's a real disaster. But prior to death, if you have neurological functions that you like, like seeing, smelling, having an orgasm, going to the bathroom, moving your thumb, moving your eyes, tasting food, any neurological function that you like, I want to preserve the neurologic reserve. And so up until death, I think the better part of Valor is to treat you to help keep that in play. And Heather would like to know, what are the best things we can do to help our bodies remyelinate? Are there any supplements or vitamins, foods, et cetera, that can help me? So remyelination in some respects is kind of a holy grail. Uh, it's the idea of putting the myelin back on the nerve. That would be like super awesome sauce. And there are multiple clinical trials currently studying that. We have not found anything that works just yet. And so I don't have a magic elixir that I can point to, which has been proven to do that. There are some things that we can do to help you preserve the reserve. And the biggest one is exercise. So exercising as part of your lifestyle is a key element to living your best life despite having MS. And it does things like uh, slow down uh, the the rate of brain volume loss. I also am a big believer in eating smart, and that involves uh, supplementing vitamin D. There's a small literature suggesting that vitamin D supplementation may help. I think that taking MS medicines, which prevent new brain damage and new attacks, is one way to stave off demyelination. And so if you don't demyelinate, then you don't have nothing that you need to remyelinate. But my answer falls short because today we don't have a lot of things that can do that. And exercise seems to be good whenever. At 66, Amen. exercise is still good. Amen. My sister from another yep. minute. 100% true. So Heather would like to know um, what, oh, let's see, what, um, forgive me, Re would like to know, why would a neurologist prescribe Tecfidera over Casimta or Ocrevus? And what is the criteria? So without giving a sassy, disparaging answer, um, I'll simply say, I don't know. I do not do that. Um, I think that when we're picking an MS medicine, I want you on the single most effective medicine that you're comfortable taking. Tecfidera is not very highly effective. Uh, Tecfidera is a twice a day pill, and it's very hard for adults to remember to take a twice a day pill. Tecfidera has side effects, can make you flush, and sometimes people don't want to take it. Um, and the disability progression that Tecfidera boasts is not very impressive. So I would much prefer to see my patient take a B-cell depleter like Kesemta or Briumvi or Ocrevus or Rituximab, all things being equal. Thank you. And I, someone named Sharon has asked a question and I've asked for more information. You may very well know what this is. Sharon has asked, do you know anything about MG? So I assume that MG is myasthenia gravis. Um, myasthenia gravis is a autoimmune condition that affects the, the myelin, but it affects it in the peripheral nerves. So it's an autoimmune condition which can demyelinate the peripheral nerves. Um, and it's uh, not something that MS neurology typically treats. It's typically in the purview um, in the realm of neuromuscular doctors. Um, and myasthenia gravis, fortunately, has several medicines that can work to help treat it. Thank you. Recently, this person's been experiencing severe headaches. Her, him or her neurologist ordered an MRI, and from the results, he thinks it's related to a lesion in the pons area of their brain. Are severe headaches a common MS symptom, and what can be done for relief besides over-the-counter medicine? So people impacted by MS are very likely, actually twice as likely to experience migraines compared to the general population. So absolutely. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, sometimes nature is too generous and you can have MS and it can give you really bad headaches. The good news is there's a host of things that can be done to treat headaches. So just for the sake of discussion, let's name five, right? So getting adequate sleep is a really, really key thing that most people don't do. Being adequately hydrated is a really key thing that most people don't do. Exercising daily is a really key thing that most people don't do. Avoiding processed foods, sugar-laden foods, fried foods, fast foods, and diet foods is something that most people don't do, but it can help. And Botox, where we, not my, not my hairline, but maybe your hairline, Botox around the crown can be remarkable for decreasing headaches. So there's probably 30 or 40 other things, but that's five that I would consider. Thank you. Does Casimto slow disability progression? Yes. Good answer. Um, Marla would like to know, when would you suggest a patient switch from Ocrevus to something else? They're asking because the disease seems to be progressing, balance, mobility, hand movements are affected. First of all, Marla is an amazing human and I love her. So Marla, it's great to see you virtually. I hope that you and your family is doing well. Second of all, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, and it really has everything to do with what you've been on before and what options remain available to you. Ocrevus is uh, very good at slowing disability progression in groups of people, but you, Marla, are not a groups of people, and it might it might merit looking for a different mechanism of action. I also think that it's very, very important that we consider all options, including management of spasticity, which could affect balance, doing the physical therapy that we talked about to help balance, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, can Deloxetine. Thank symbol. you. Speed up cataract growth to the point of medically necessary surgery in just a few months. That has not been my experience, but I don't know the answer, but I have not seen that in practice and I use a lot of Cymbalta. Okay. And can MS cause death? I thought one could expect a near normal lifespan. So in the modern era with the earliest diagnosis and the earliest application of the most effective therapies, we can ask for a normal life expectancy. Uh, and so that's my expectation when I'm treating people in this modern era. Very, very rarely MS can cause uh, devastating disease over time. And uh, I have seen one or two patients where I truly believe they died related to their MS. But the vast majority, 99.99% of people with MS who pass away are passing away from complications of MS like MS led to a decubitus ulcer that seeded the bone, God forbid, or MS caused urosepsis, God forbid, or MS caused an aspiration pneumonia, which caused sepsis, something like that. I have not heard you mention Tysabri. Do you still recommend Tysabri? Tysabri, Tysabri, Tysabri. There, you've heard me mention it three times. Tysabri remains one of the most effective drugs to treat multiple sclerosis. And I have a bunch of patients at my center that take Tysabri. Now, in full disclosure, Tysabri is given 13 times a year, and that's a lot of times. And so um, increasingly, I think patients gravitate towards a twice a year infusion with a B cell depleter. That stated, Tysabri should not be slept on because it is an outstanding therapy and highly effective. Thank you. Debbie said um, she'd like you to tell or about the FDA approved new drug Fliximilab? So that medicine is not FDA approved. Uh, that medicine is currently being studied and it is an anti CD40 ligand. Um, and so at the Boster Center, we're launching two new clinical trials studying these anti CD40 ligands, and they're involved in um, interrupting B cell T cell communication. They're involved in the periphery, and we are very, very hopeful that they're going to prove to be an outstanding therapy. We will see B cell or we will see BTK inhibitors come to market first, and then these uh, CD40 ligands will come later. Um, Carol said that she has PPMS, just diagnosed with breast cancer, and she said DCIS in site two, thankfully. Should I stop Ocrevus, which I have been on for around five years? 
So Carol, um, I don't have enough information to answer your question. That stated, when we first studied Ocrevus uh, with the OPERA 1 and 2 trial and the oratorio trial, we were concerned that it might increase the risk of breast cancer. And we've subsequently proven -uh, that it does not increase the risk of breast cancer. Now, I don't want to give you advice over the interwebs without enough information, but this is 100% a discussion with your neurologist and your oncologist. If I was voting, and again, please keep in mind, I don't have enough information, I would vote to continue on Ocrevus. Okay. Um, what causes, Heather wants to know, what causes MS to change from regular lesions to tumefactive? Yep. Yeah. After many years of MS, I originally had regular lesions for 10 years, but five years ago started getting, say that again? Tumefactive. So, Tumefactive. So, you know, doctors, for some weird reason, want to use foreign words to describe things, maybe because it's confusing. I don't know. So the word tumefactive means looks like a tumor, but it ain't. So that's what tumefactive means. So when you're looking at an MRI, sometimes an MS lesion is freaky deaky looking and it looks like a big scary tumor and it's got it's really large and it's got a lot of swelling around it um and that's called a tumefactive lesion and we don't know why someone may develop a tumefactive lesion mm -hmm. what's really interesting is when you study the behavior of tumefactive lesions they typically cause less overall damage long term than smaller lesions which is kind of a uh, counterpoint to what you might assume interesting um, Kay said that, and I can't pronounce this either, dysautonomia. Can you see it? Are you? I can't see it, but I think you're saying dysautonomia. Thank you. I'm so sorry that I'm not familiar with that. Something that you commonly see in MS patients? So, so dysautonomia means that the autonomic nervous system doesn't work very well. It's all jacked up. And it is not common to see dysautonomia in MS. There's a couple of ways that it could happen, but it's very like convoluted and, and awkward to make it happen. And we generally don't see dysautonomia in, in the setting of multiple sclerosis. Okay. And um, in your opinion, is Casinta effective for PPMS and safe for a patient over the age of 60? So Kisemta, uh, which is ufotumumab, has never been studied in PPMS. So we don't actually know. That stated, it probably works in PPMS because it's an effective B-cell depleter like Ocrevus and Rituximab. Have I ever used Kisemta off-label to treat PPMS? Yes, I have. Uh, so during the pandemic, um, I had a couple patients that were in the Dakotas, which are way out in the middle of nowhere, and they weren't anywhere near um, a neurologist. They weren't anywhere near an infusion center with PPMS. And so we started them on Kisemta. But that's, again, very off-label because we don't have any information on that. Now, is it safe in people who are 60 and over? Yes, I think it is. I, I think that there's a, uh, a plague amongst some MS neurologists where they become ageist. And they say stupid stuff like, oh, honey, you're so old, we shouldn't give you medicines anymore, which is, which is infuriating to me. And I think everything is a risk benefit. So as you get older, you increase the risk of infection. And Kisemta is a, is a B cell depleter, which can cause immunosuppression. And so it is rational to make sure that someone receiving Kisemta is not at increased risk of infection. How do we do that? Well, we check and see if they're having any infections. And we can check some laboratories as well. But I would not avoid Kisemta just because you happen to have celebrated your 60th birthday. Gretchen says there are so many specialists out there online that have these amazing claims to stop MS, remyelinate nerves, and more. How does one know if this doctor or specialist is legit? In a word, that's bullshit. I guess that's technically two words, right? So excuse my language. Um, there is nothing worse in my mind than selling false hope. And that's what that is. Um, but that really doesn't address your question. That was just me being emotionally inappropriate. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And 
when I hear about something where I'm like, ooh, ooh, then the first thing I do is I go to pubmed.gov. So pubmed.gov is a government website where every published scientific article is present. And if the therapy that they're boasting about has been properly reviewed by real scientists and doctors, it will be published and it will be available for review on pubmed.gov. So the very first thing I would do is I would look and see if the thing that they're recommending has been adequately studied. Another thing you can do is you can ask your MS neurologist, hey, I heard about XYZ, is this a good idea or not? I want you to be very, very cautious about charlatans and quacks. And I want you to keep in mind that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Good point. Cat's, Cat has said, is JC virus positive an issue if considering switching from glutiramere acetate to mavinclad or ocrevus? No. Okay, good answer. Um, your experience with patient side effects as to tolerance of ocrevus versus kesimpta? kesimpta? So ocrevus and kesimpta um, are both highly effective B-cell depleters. Ocrevus is given in the vein twice a year. Kesimpta is a self-administered shot once a month. So right there, you have a risk of infusion reactions with ocrevus, which you wouldn't have with kesimpta because you're not infusing it. And you have a risk of injection reactions with kesimpta that you wouldn't have with ocrevus because you're not injecting it. Um, with, with kesimpta, some people feel kind of punky and flu-like the first, maybe the second infusion, but I generally don't see that afterwards. Also, if you've been taking kesimpta for a really long time, it, it can, you can get something that we call um, injection fatigue, where it just gets really frustrating and tiring to constantly have to jab yourself with a needle. Um, but there's, uh, there's differences in the administration and most of the side effect profile comes from those differences. I just saw that Robert Eckelman raised his hand. So Robert's an amazing gentleman uh, down in Florida, a really, really cool guy. So, hey, I hope you're wow, doing let's, let's get the Let's do this one question first, then we'll, we'll call on Robert. Um, Heather said, over 15 years, I have been on a lot of DMTS and all have failed me so far. Rebif, Tecfidera, Ocrevus, Tysabri, Mavenclad, da, 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 Tysabri again, and now just finished uh, her first round of Limtrada. I'm hopeful this one works for me, but if it does not, do people go backwards from the top efficacy med to something different to see if it will work? So obviously this is a very complex situation and I don't have enough information to be really, really intelligent. Um, I think what I'll say instead uh, is that we have to keep fighting and that um, different mechanisms of action may be very helpful. And so if we're not winning with one mechanism of action, we're going to look for another one. Um, and I, I'm very hopeful that your Lemtrada will hold your disease at bay. Best of luck. Okay. Now, Robert has put his question in, but I'm happy to put him online if you'd like to talk. So your way is great. Okay. Well, Robert, I guess, whatever, go ahead and answer. It says, I have been seeing a lot of uh, about COVID vaccinations. Most say it cannot cause a flare. Your thoughts? So anytime you receive any vaccine, uh, what you're doing is you're introducing some form of virus, whether that be a dead virus or a live but attenuated virus into your body to show your immune system. And your immune system then builds an arsenal against it. That's how a vaccine works. So I anecdotally have absolutely seen a handful of patients where they got a COVID vaccine and it triggered an attack. So I believe based on my clinical experience that it is possible. It's not very common. I want to keep in mind, however, that COVID massively increases the risk of a MS attack. And as we saw at the recent ectrams, can increase the risk of attacks subsequent to having COVID and progression of disability. So my opinion is it's still the better part of valor to get vaccinated against COVID. I think dealing with the risk of the vaccine is way better than dealing with the risk of the infection itself. 
Thank you. And we go back to Phage from Jerusalem. He went to, he had sent in a message on Facebook she. saying, excuse me? It's a she, she's a she. Oh, Phage is a she? Okay. Um, they said, oh no, crap gap, tell me about it. Six calendar months between treatments, etched in stone. Took one day of intravenous steroids, so some solimidrol. Um, a little improvement, but nothing long lasting. I am offered three consecutive days of steroids, but side effects, no sleep, long trip to Hadassah. I can't see the point of doing any more, um, anything more besides waiting it out till the coming Ocrevus infusion. Thoughts? So, so one potential thought would be to do a gram of steroids, so one day, two months before the infusion, and then one month before the infusion. So kind of um, hopscotching through. You might try the three days of steroids to see if that carries you forward. And I appreciate your comments that it's a lot to have to deal with. Um, but I think that your doctor's trying to make it work um, by using some form of uh, some form of a steroid to kind of get you to that point. Um, I wish you the best of luck, and it's really, really frustrating. Yeah. Um, as of right now, I do not have any new questions, so I'm going to give a couple seconds and see if anybody has. Let me check and see if anybody has their hands raised. Don't see anybody. That's it. Here's one uh, from Samira. Yeah. Oh, I did. I made. I made up that name. It's not Samira. It's Samia. 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 Added an R. Sorry. <laughs> Thoughts on blurry vision and heat? So, MS is a weird disease, and one of the weird things about MS is that you can have worsening symptoms when you get overheated. And I don't mean I dislike heat. I mean that when I get overheated, my symptoms get worse. And one of the classic examples is something called Uthoff's phenomenon. So Uthoff is a dead European guy that named this after himself a long time ago. And what he noticed was when someone with MS got overheated, the area where the eye where they had optic neuritis goes blurry again. In fact, back in the ancient days of yesteryear, not that long ago, actually, before MRIs were invented, one of the ways that we would attempt to diagnose multiple sclerosis is we would take uh, someone in whom we expected or suspected MS and we put them in a hot bath, right? So it was called the hot bath test. And we would see if they would go blind again. Um, and in some hospitals that I've worked in, they have some room, it's typically in one of the upper floors where they've left the bath, the bathtub in the room historically. Um, and so when you have Uthoff's phenomenon, when you lose vision, when you get overheated, that's very unpleasant. And so there's actually a medicine for that. There's a medicine, not everybody responds, but there's a medicine called 4-aminopyridine. So in the United States, it's called Ampira, and overseas, it's called Fampira. And 4-aminopyridine, if it works for you, buttresses against Uthoff's phenomenon. So when you get overheated, you can still see. Um, how much magnesium, Re would like to know, how much magnesium and zinc per day, and is it good for MS? So I can't give you a specific recommendation for you, and it also depends on what you're trying to treat. So for example, I have some patients that use magnesium oxide, 400 milligrams twice a day um, for spasticity, and that works very well for them. Um, I have other patients that take magnesium gluconate to help with constipation, and there's a different dose for that. Um, but I really think that we have to ask ourselves, why are we taking it? Um, and we need to know a little bit more about you in order to answer that question appropriately. Um, what are you most excited for with MS research right now? That's Heather asking. Great. That's a great question. So I really think there's maybe three things that I'm most excited about. One of the things I'm most excited about is a conceptual change in uh, the way that we frame MS. Um, and so we now are being honest about the presence of so-called smoldering multiple sclerosis, that you don't just get bad from incomplete recovery from attacks. You don't just get bad from new spots. 
you can have a slow worsening independent from those things, independent from relapses. And the reason that's so important is we have to be honest about that so we can find it so that we can come up with treatments for it. And so that's one thing that I'm very excited about. A second thing that I'm very excited about is a blood test called neurofilament light chain that you may have heard of. And neurofilament light chain allows us to assess disease activity. Um, it's not prime time just yet. We haven't sorted out all the uh, benchmarks for uh, normal controls, but it holds a lot of promise for us to be able to draw a blood test and have some sense of, are you responding to your therapy or are, is your disease under good control or not? The third thing, as I mentioned earlier in this webinar, is the uh, new class of medication called the BTK inhibitors, brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I'm very, very excited about those medicines coming to market. Thank you. Jeannie, Jeannie wants to know, um, she's taking Ocrevus and has had two doses. How does she know if it's working? So in order to answer that question, we have to think about the goals of Ocrevus. And I'll answer the question actually with an analogy. If you're on an oral birth control pill and you get pregnant, it didn't work, all right? Because the goal of an oral birth control pill is to prevent an unplanned event, an unplanned pregnancy. The absence of a, of a pregnancy is proof the birth control pill worked, right? Similarly, if you're taking an MS medicine and you're having attacks or new spots on the MRI, or your brain is shrinking too quickly, or you're accruing neurological disability on exam, it's not working. So the absence of those bad things is evidence of success. Thank you. Um, Marla is asking, not a question. Oh, sorry. Um, Michelle, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but it looks like Michelle from Facebook. She's asking um, that she's just recently been diagnosed with MS. Her neurologist says, that she has inactive MS. And she's confused on what exactly that means. I do have several lesions bilaterally seen in the MRI. I do have symptoms of MS, migraines, extreme fatigue, bladder issues, blurry vision, face goes tingly at least a few times weekly, just trying to understand this condition. So inactive MS is not a term. Um, I would find a different doctor personally. I'm not trying to be disparaging. Um, but I don't think inactive MS is an appropriate concept. Maybe what they meant was at the time they did the MRI, there were no enhancing lesions. And so they said that there was no new activity. I'm not sure. Um, but I don't, I don't find that terminology to be very useful. And Julio from Facebook says, thank you for the information. And uh, do you have anything on the Octave blood test? So um, there is a tremendous effort on multiple fronts to come up with biomarkers for multiple sclerosis. A biomarker is a, uh, a tool that we could use to help us um, try to better understand a human being. And I actually have a biomarker that I set aside over here. This is my favorite biomarker. Um, this is a tricorder. So let me see. So. Um, so this is what Bones McCoy would use on Star Trek, where he would, and so um, he could diagnose multiple sclerosis on on uh, distant alien planets using a tricorder, right? And so one of my patients actually gave me a tricorder, which I just think is like the coolest thing ever. Um, in the absence of a tricorder, it would be really great to develop some blood tests that are biomarkers. And there are many companies right now that are eagerly trying to develop that. Octave is one of them. Thank you. Debbie, I'd like to know, is there anything comparable to Nudexta, which is so expensive? So, so um, Debbie is talking about a condition called pseudobulbar affect, right? And that's a Scrabble word if I've ever heard one. Pseudobulbar affect uh, means that the human being will start laughing hysterically and nothing's funny and they can't stop. Or they will start crying and their tears are flowing and they're not sad. There is a disconnect between the affect, the way they appear, and the emotion, the way they feel. And Nudexta is the only FDA-approved therapy to treat pseudobulbar affect, and it is very expensive. It's a twice-a-day medicine. It's actually a combination of, of two medicines. 
There are old school ways of treating pseudobulbar affect. So using the tricyclic antidepressants or using SSRI, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are two old school ways of treating um, that condition and they're much less expensive. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, do you have a couple extra minutes? Can we go a little beyond or you have someplace to go as soon as um, 7.30? Family waiting for dinner. So let, maybe let's just do one or two more. Otherwise I may okay. have to sleep outside. Good enough. <laughs> we don't want you to sleep outside. So, and that means your dog would have to sleep outside. So both yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah, that would be That would be her. absolutely, no. Plus that, we're in Ohio, answer. Deb, and it's cold here. Yes, so it's exactly. Cold exactly. Here. And it's raining in Florida. So there's no win-win. So um, this is a great question. Does depression related to MS come from being diagnosed with an incurable chronic disease or is it from, or is it more related to chemical changes in the brain from MS lesions? The answer is yes, both are true. Yes. So there's actually structural and chemical changes that occur in the brain in particular spots up front, which can lead to depression in MS and Having a condition which is kind of an unknown where you're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow is another setup for depression. So both are true. Okay, thank you. We have one more question and we're going to stop. And, and everybody can finish next time you're on. We can ask the rest. Um, Debbie wants to know, can you please describe the difference between smoldering MS and SPMS? Yeah, so the concept of smoldering MS conceptually is that in the background, MS is slowly causing damage. Uh, my friend Gavin Giovannoni uh, gave an example of like a shredder that's placed on low, and it's just very slowly chewing up paper in that example, okay? So that's smoldering MS. SPMS is an old school uh, description of someone who isn't having very many attacks the way they used to, but they are slowly getting worse. Now, smoldering MS is a concept to help describe what's going on in MS. SPMS, uh, I think, is a, uh, a, a stereotype that I don't like very much. You're, you are able to draw some conclusions, but the thing about smoldering MS is it doesn't just happen in the second half of the disease. If you look carefully, you can see smoldering MS as early as you care to look early on in the disease. So I think smoldering MS is a very helpful term. I think SPMS should be thrown out the window. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. If you've missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and it will be available through our MS Focus Facebook page and our YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email for information on how to access the recordings or to sign up for our newsletter, which is going to tell you all about the upcoming events. Our next teleconference will be this Thursday evening, November 16th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. And this particular event is in honor of National Caregivers Month, which is November. It will consist of three special couples and our MS certified nurse, Sherry Bins, as the moderator. Try not to miss it, folks, because it's really going to be quite informative. Um, as you leave the conference today, a survey will appear on your screen, and we ask that each of you take a moment to give us your feedback on the program and your suggestions for future topics so we can be sure to provide you with the best programs that are most meaningful to you. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation and especially to Dr. Boster, who answers one question after another, barely coming up for air. At least you took a sip of your water. <laughs> that was nice to see. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and we hope to see you again real soon.